Assalamu alaikum. Mr. Moderator, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, our friends and, and our enemies. So the first thing we want to ask Zach is about Cointel. Cointel Pro and uh, what that was all about, how it started, what their aims were. Just okay, should I put it in the context of Malcolm or don't worry about it? In other words, this no, is more background. Just as a generality right now, what, what was the program of Cointel? Who were they targeting and so on and so forth? Okay. Okay, so just go ahead and just start when I want to start. Right. Okay. Um, the counterintelligence you know, program is something that the FBI initiated during um, the, uh, well, actually, we need to put this in historical context. Uh, and probably the first step would be to define what counterintelligence is, because I think a lot of people don't really have an understanding of what counterintelligence is. The best way to do that is to first define what intelligence is. Intelligence simply means acquiring information. And as far as, you know, if you work for an agency, for example, it could be FBI, it could be military intelligence, it could be NYPD or what have you. If your job is to gather intelligence, all that simply means is, you know, you're going to document it, you're going to get any types of, you know, any type of information that could then, you know, be used to better evaluate whatever the target is. Counterintelligence is something different, though. Counterintelligence deals with first getting the information and then using the information or using some type of scheme, some type of program, something, some type of technique, some type of activity in order to hurt, in order to discredit, in order to disrupt, in order to destroy, or they like to use the term neutralize, which is kind of like an all-encompassing term, which means to weaken to the point that it's no longer a threat. Counterintelligence, you can go all the way back to the turn of the century and you can see aspects of counterintelligence. But when you really begin to see it directed at dissidents in the United States, where I like to begin is probably with the Garvey movement. Those of you, you know, people who have read, for example, the Garvey papers, um, um, know that J. Edgar Hoover was able to build his reputation during the you know, post-World War I period by going after Garvey. And in fact, it reached a point whereby the person who would actually introduce Marcus Garvey to the Madison Square Garden you know, conventions that the Universal Negro Improvement Association would hold every year was actually someone who was on the payroll of the agency which became the FBI. You know, they went through a lot of name changes. Um, and of course, that whole you know, mail fraud campaign against Marcus Garvey was actually something that the Justice Department with Hoover and other people actually created. It was a facade. They, you know, Garvey really did not commit mail fraud. But I'm saying all that basically to say that that is when you begin to see his origin, particularly against black people, or I prefer to use the term African peoples. Now, after World War II is when you really begin to see it escalating. And one reason that explains this, A, you had a, you know, the United States, you know, American society at that stage, you know, had a very blatant enemy, communists, the communists, uh, A. And then B, is after World War II that you really begin to see J. Edgar Hoover beginning to consolidate his own authority, consolidating his own power. Um, so that by the time you get into the middle of the 1950s, the FBI, is ready to officialize a counterintelligence program. Now, I say officialize simply because they're going to use techniques that they were already using anyway against other groups, you know, you know, during the war, even before the war, specifically communist groups. But when they initiate the, uh, you know, the first counterintelligence program, or COINTELPRO as they like to call it, the major target was the Communist Party USA. And of course, that's going to set the stage for them to then, you know, go after groups like the Socialist Workers Party in 1961, Ku Klux Klan groups in 1964, 
uh, the Nation of Islam, which had actually began, you know, decades earlier, et cetera, et cetera, accumulating in the most visible and the most prominent, you know, the black nationalist hate type groupings of the late 1960s. Now, one of the unique features of counterintelligence is that the bottom line is to use anything that you can use in order to destroy your enemy. And I think that for the average person, it's difficult for them to really begin to put, you know, to, to really understand what that means. Uh, I think one former FBI agent probably put it best. Uh, that was Arthur Murtaugh, who was, you know, who used to, you know, who used to work for the Atlanta office during the King era. And one of the points that he said is that you must realize that counterintelligence operators, you know, that is those people who are, you know, those agents who are involved in counterintelligence. He said they have fiendish minds. And what he was saying that is, is that, is that an operation will be successful or unsuccessful depending upon how diabolical a scheme they could come up with. Now, one of the keys to counterintelligence, though, is to plant a seed and then to rely upon people to react to that seed a certain way. And if they give you the reaction that you want, then a lot of times that will accumulate in you achieving your goal. Now, another point that you want to be clear on is that, is that one of the things that counterintelligence has, has used for a very long time is simply to exploit existing weaknesses of people. Jealousies and envies, personality conflicts, um, anything that they could use in order to weaken a target groups like the FBI historically have used. And remember too, the best counterintelligence operation is those operations in which the intelligence agency, be it FBI, be it CIA, always remains in the background. In fact, the very best, as one former CIA official said, the very best counterintelligence operations are those that remain secret from inception to eternity. Now, what this does for people like myself is it makes it very difficult sometimes trying to uncover it. Because remember now, the best type of counterintelligence that you're going to find, you're, we're not supposed to know. I'm not supposed to know about it, and you're not supposed to know about it. And the people that are being targeted in it, they're not supposed to know about it either. And so that makes it very difficult for us to then begin to piece things together. And of course, that's very consistent with the concept of plausible denial. And of course, plausible denial is something that the intelligence community has developed. And this is simply a very unique, a very sophisticated way to deny their participation, their knowledge of operations, which are generally illegal, immoral, unethical because most counterintelligence activities that you find are one of the above. Immoral, illegal, unethical. Um, and of course you don't have to be a genius to figure out why you know plausible denial exists. The other reason that it exists is that it's a protection, if you will, um, for senior officials who do not have to you know, be connected to some of these schemes. And one of the, uh, there are basically two major, I'm going into detail, so, you know, edit, you know, what you need. But there are two major ways that very sickening counterintelligence schemes are authorized by senior officials. One is, of course, euphemisms. And that's simply when you use real nice terms in order to order something that's not real nice. You know, um, classic, classic example, um, classic example, August 18th, 1960, National Security Council meeting. Um, Dwight D. Eisenhower is there and several other senior officials, and they're talking about Patrice Lumumba of the Congo. CIA Director Alan Dulles is there, too. And Eisenhower, who represents the highest authority in any type of counterintelligence scheme. In fact, in the intelligence community, the president represents the highest authority. He stops the meeting when they're talking about Lumumba. He looks at Alan Dulles, 
And he tells Alan Dulles, Patrice Lumumba is one man. One man cannot stop the United States government from implementing policy. Alice Dulles, Alan Dulles, who has been trained to pick up the energy, because remember, the, the whole key to plausible denial and authorizing you know, these messages is the energy that you receive from a senior official. He picked up the energy, left the meeting, immediately authorized assassination of Patrice Lumumba and, and sent it down the channels saying he had the highest authority. Well, that's how that works. And see, later on, what happened is actually what's supposed to happen. Later on, they had a congressional hearing in which these allegations were made. All but one person in that entire meeting who was still alive said that he thought that was an, an assassination order. Everybody else who was interviewed, who testified in the hearing, they said, no, he just made a statement that he was just one man. That's how it's supposed to work. And therefore, plausible denial is intact. That one person who interpreted was a man by the name of Robert Johnson. He was a very perceptive person because he should not, if they did it right, he should not have even interpreted that evidence as an assassination order. Now, the final point is that, or shall I say, the second way that a very sensitive counterintelligence operation is authorized is what is known as circumlocution. That's when you simply beat around the bush. You know, you want something done, you won't say, I want you to kill such and such. You say, you know, such and such really would be real nice. I mean, you know, suppose it was two men and one of these men you didn't really like that well and you just wish something bad would happen to him. Something real simple, ridiculous like that. But if you say that to the wrong person at the right time, it could be deemed as an assassination order. And we have cases like that in the United States government. So to kind of bring some type of closure to this, the only way that we're going to understand counterintelligence is for us to realize that, A, the sky was the limit, as one former you know, uh, FBI informant said. He, he said this, you know, that, um, that the sky was basically the limit. Anything, if it could bring results, that's all they cared about. If it meant, for example, somebody getting killed, that didn't matter. If it meant that the person ended up you know, going to jail for something that they didn't do, it didn't matter. If it, mean, uh, if it meant burning down buildings or arson, it didn't matter. If it meant breaking in people's, if it meant you know, getting information about someone's sex life and then circulating it or using it as a form, uh, you know, of black male or white male, depending on what side of the fence you're on, it didn't matter. And that's how counterintelligence worked. And of course, we're going to see this in Malcolm's assassination. We're going to see counterintelligence in the King assassination. We're going to see counterintelligence in many of the government sponsored, um, you know, um, assassinations during the 1960s.